We can just bob our heads like it is going. <laughs> like you we, could. Doing anyway. we could. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised you can't hear that. I'm just blowing me out of my chair. All right. Uh, looks like we're up on YouTube and going live on Facebook here in a second. Hey, there we are. Okay. No. <laughs> uh, today's yeah. Tonight's a quiet night, folks. Well, <laughs> let's pretend we 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 we've gone through it. Yeah. Okay. We we've already played our intro song, so through. we're done. You know, yeah. Yeah. I'm satisfied. Thanks very much. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, good evening, everyone, and welcome back to our Sunday night offering of Astronomy Outreach, the Sunday Night Astronomy Show. Uh, my name is Chris Kerwin of Astronomy by the Bay. First of all, I'd like to welcome back uh, our regular co-host, Paul Owen, from the Moonshadow Observatory here in Hampton, or there in Hampton. Uh, Mr. Mike Powell from the PFO Observatory here in St. John. And we have a new, another gentleman here, a surprise guest this evening, Mr. John Reed. Hey! 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 <laughs> John is the... Uh, is the uh, well-known author of the 50 Things to See uh, series of books, and John's going to have a talk with us this evening about uh, why he's here with us and what the, what the plan is. So we're going to get to that in just a couple of minutes. So uh, on tonight's program, uh, when you are trying to capture the night sky, uh, knowing how the settings work in your camera is a crucial to getting that perfect shot. Uh, well, tonight, Paul is going to give us some information on exposure, ISO, and shutter speed, and how that relates to imaging the night sky. Also tonight, after a brief uh, reveal of all of your amazing photos, we'll be making our draw for the prizes for the most recent Shoot the Moon contest as well. And also tonight, Binal Bud will be paying us another visit uh, as he reveals to us another interesting target uh, in the night sky. And Paul's going to be back with us with another interesting Rosanna's Fun Fact segment as well. And if we have time, we'll take a quick look at what to watch for in the night sky over the next week. And of course, we'll have all your wonderful photos uh, to share as well tonight. So sit back and grab your favorite beverage and snack and enjoy. And remember, this is the family-friendly live broadcast. So if you happen to have any questions about the night sky, we're happy to try to answer them here for you. So let's get started with the program. Just making sure that everything's good on YouTube. We are, and we're all... Hello, Lisa. Lisa's joined us in, on Facebook. Hey, and... Lisa. Hey, Mike. Hey, Mike Powell. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, twice. There you are. <laughs> Okay, well, first of all, we're going to welcome John Reed to our, our program, and John's going to give us some info on uh, something that's coming up for this month of August. Yeah. So, hey, everyone. Uh, this is John Reed, author of The 50 Things to See with a Telescope, soon to be adding another book, 110 Things to See with a Telescope. Uh, I bet you can guess what that list is. But for the month of August, my book, 50 Things to See on the Moon, and another book called For All Humankind, which is a book by uh, Dr. Tanya Harrison and as well co-author with a friend of hers, we'll be donating all of our royalties to St. Jude's Mission Inspire, uh, which has to do with the Inspiration4 mission, the all-civilian orbitable orbital space flight that takes off on September 15th, uh, in which they're raising, or trying to raise at least, hundreds of millions of dollars for this children's research hospital. And so people all around the world are doing their part. There was an earlier, and maybe Chris, you'll have to tell me a little bit more about this because I just found out from Lisa today that your guys' names are going up on the spacecraft on the back of, is it a poem written by uh, Dr. Cyan Proctor, who is, is. The, who made a pilot for the mission? It is exactly, yep. So uh, she was taking donations for names to be listed on the back of the form and it was, and actually goes in orbit. So uh, yeah, we're quite, quite excited about it. It's awful nice, yep. And thanks to Lisa, I think Lisa's on here. Lisa, Lisa Fanning yeah. donated that for us, so it was awesome. That's fantastic, so I don't have a copy of T Dr. Tanya Harrison's book to show. Yeah. Um, if you have one, if you could I, bring that I, I can share that uh, photo that you sent me, John, if you want. Yeah, absolutely. Now, this this book is really interesting. It's a completely different approach. I'm assuming most most of you maybe have, you know, my books. I'm not going to talk about 50 things to see on the moon. But Tanya's book, um, which maybe you don't have, and which would make an, a, a great present to give to all your friends, um, is about the stories that happen to regular people and how the Apollo 11 mission impacted their lives. So it, it 
plays, uh, the, every story starts sort of with that person or that family as they experience the Apollo 11 mission and then how that inspired them to be the people they are today. And so For All Humankind is, is a great book for that alternative. And it's also a very international um, book. So I, I read this quite a while ago, so I, it's not top of mind, but, but you have a, there's a New Brunswick, um, if I recall, one story follows a pilot and they actually go to New Brunswick in, in the story, which is, which is really cool. And then there's some other ones from different continents, and different countries as well, where we follow what the moon landing did to them as people. And so, so again, if you don't have for all humankind, or if you know uh, someone who likes space and you want to give them a gift, um, that that would be the book to get. Uh, and as and as well as fifty things to see on the moon. Now, if you do uh, purchase one of the books for uh, during the month of August, again, all our royalties, me and, and Tanya, um, and then Danny Bednar, who's who's a co-author with Tanya. We're, we're going to take all our royalties and, and put them toward the Space uh, Space to Inspire fundraiser. Um, also goes by St. Jude Mission Inspires for the, for the Inspiration for Mission. If you do that, please post on social media that that you've participated, that you've got one of these books, because otherwise we won't we won't really know until our royalty reports come in. But we'd love to know, like right now or tonight. Like if you got that book tonight, let us know, and then we can share that that you're participating. Um, you know, in Space to Inspire, tag Space to Inspire, tag Tanya, she goes by Tanya of Mars on all the social media platforms. Her favorite is Twitter, um, but she's on Instagram too. Tag me, learn to stargaze, tag at Inspiration4. Let them know you got the books. Let them know they're supporting St. Jude. Um, and we'll be so excited um, to share along in the journey with you as well. And don't forget to watch the launch on September 15th. So that's it for me. Awesome. That's awesome, John. Awesome. Good, good luck with that. Yeah, that's exciting. And um, it's certainly a worthwhile cause. So, um, yeah, we'll put the word forth here for sure. Yeah. And, um, yeah, that's that's just unbelievable. I think that's, uh, that's going to be quite a project for you. And I know St. Jude is an American hospital, but it's a research hospital. So the research that they do impacts – people around the world. I know the closest thing we have in Canada is probably the IWK in Halifax, yeah. and I'm sure they partner on their research as well. So, yeah. you know, an amazing cause uh, all around. And you get a book, you get For All Humankind, or you get 50 Things to See on the Moon. Awesome. Thanks, yeah. John. That's that's, awesome. that's an awesome idea, and uh, hopefully they catch lots of money. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. All right, well, I'm okay. going to sign off and put my okay. three kids to bed. Yeah, good All luck right. there. Yeah. Thanks again for having me on the show. You bet. Thanks, you John. John. Anytime, John. Take care. All right. Okay. Talk bye -bye. to you later. Bye bye. Take care. There you go. Our friend John Reed. That's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, it's fantastic. Okay. Um, from there, I'm going to, well, I'll probably put that post up on my page a little bit later on, too. So if you want to get more information about it, um, it'll be up there. And I, John is on Facebook as well. And, of course, he's on social media everywhere. So, so from there, we're going to get to uh, uh, Paul. Uh, your talk about ISO shutter speed and what's the third one. Oh ISO, yeah, ISO shutter speed and exposure. Yeah, yeah. And how that yeah. relates. Yeah, uh, the the three things you need to know about a camera to make it take a picture. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, I can do that. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm going to figure out how to share this presentation. Because it's 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 not a it's not going to be long, very very short actually, but I just want to cover some points. And I guess before I switch to that, um, I just want to cover the points on if you're new to taking photographs of the night sky, you wanted to you want to go out there and take some pictures of the night sky, and you've never done it before, and you don't know where to begin with your camera, well. A lot of people will go online and they're going to look for what are the settings I need to put my camera on to take a picture of the night sky. And easy enough to find it. I mean, it's quite simple to, to find those things. There's, there's a gazillion YouTube videos on it and all that stuff. But what they don't explain to you is what those settings actually, what you're actually changing in those settings. So you actually understand it so that if you want to take pictures of, um, you know, like behind me, the Milky Way, that's a totally different approach 
than if you want to say take a picture of the moon. And they're two opposite sides of the scale in terms of what you need for setting. So a lot of the times if you want to go shoot moon pictures, well now you're going to have to go and then get you know their ideas on what you should be setting your camera at. But they may not have the same lens as you. They may not have the same camera as you. So if you don't understand you know the the basic concepts of what those buttons that you're moving are, then it just makes you relying on everybody else to set the camera up that you're going to be by yourself in the middle of the night and probably getting frustrated with not getting the shot you want because you don't understand, uh, you know, these, these, these things about ISO shutter speed and, uh, and um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, if you don't understand them, I mean, yeah. No intro music. No intro music. Did anybody miss that tonight? Somebody on here said, I missed the bobble hits. Somebody already said that. Oh, you didn't miss them. We're here. Trust yeah. me. We're bobbling anyway. That's right. We're for bobble heads now. We're going to karaoke it tonight. All right. I'm going to try okay. to make this thing work. Um, so, good golly, Miss Molly. Let's cross our fingers. And uh, let's see if I can make that happen. And then I'm going to make it happen here, uh, which is probably this one. I'm hoping. Comes up on your screen. Ignore that. Yep. yep. Okay. The trouble is, is I can't make it go back and forth. So where's the one that I have to? There it is. Do you want to pin that, Paul? Uh, no, no, not yet. I just want to make sure that I'm operating it properly. Okay. Um. For some reason, it doesn't look right to me because it's not allowing me to, to switch back and forth. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to stop presenting for a minute and get this correct. Okay. So I have to. Okay. So we just she shut it right off altogether. I'm going to have to close the whole program and then open it again. I had it on on hold, and I shouldn't have. I should have just waited and turned it on. So now I've got all these programs that are running that shouldn't be there there we go slideshow start from current and see if that works there we go perfect and now you should be able to see the astrotography triangle uh no oh yeah, yeah i'm not sharing now i have to escape again Good golly miss molly this is not my day i'm too tired i shouldn't have been doing it uh There we go. I'll try that again. And slideshow. Start from current. And we'll see if that happens. There we go. You seen it now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. There we go. Okay. So basically, what we're looking at here, <laughs> for those uh, who know a little bit about uh, cameras, and forget about all the words written around, just concentrate on that triangle in the center. And that's what they call the exposure triangle. So camera 101, when you're learning about cameras, if you're gonna take a course in photography, this is the first thing they're gonna they're gonna teach you is, you know, what is aperture, what shutter speed, and what is ISO, and what do they mean, and how, you know, how do you reuse them in relation to, uh, you know, taking control of your camera. So basically, I'm just going to cover what aperture is, what shutter speed is, and what ISO is, and uh, and a little bit about how they relate to um, each of the um, uh, uh, items that we might we may want to image in the night sky. For example, the Milky Way or or the Moon. So aperture. Let's actually just go right to what's the first one I got. Excuse me. It's going to be um, ISO. So ISO. If you if you had your camera in your hand, ISO is the one uh, years ago. And if you ever used a film camera, you'd have to buy your film based on the amount of sensitivity you want. So if you were going to go to a concert, you would look for like 400 or 800 um, uh, speed film because that was the stuff that you needed in order to get enough light onto your pictures to be able to actually see them. So so basically choosing your film speed was how you chose the sensitivity. Well, with modern cameras in the digital era, the ISO, which is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, which is designated by, uh, you know, like numbers like 100, 200, 400, 800, and so on, 
that's basically the, the sensitivity of your um, of your sensor. Now, the thing is with the ISO, it if you wanted to crank up your ISO, say to 800 or 1600, something like that, you're going to get your 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 uh, sensor is going to be very very sensitive to light. But there's a trade-off. The higher that you keep pushing that ISO button, then the more noise that you're going to be introducing to your image. And because that you're introducing more noise, you in fact lose sharp detail. You lose sharpness at the same time. So, <clears throat> so basically, ISO when you look at your camera will go from say 100, or in in some cases 50. Some ISO cameras have are down to 50. And then right on up to the sky's limit, you know, over a hundred thousand. Although I don't know who'd be shooting at that ISO, but in any event, it's it's in there, it's in the camera. But the usable range for um, for uh, clean images is probably up to about you know maybe twelve thousand, a little bit more, depending on the sensitivity of your camera, or, or sorry, depending on the quality of the sensor in your camera. Some cameras will introduce a lot of noise a lot earlier in the ISO. Uh, uh, train. So depending on your camera, you'd have to, you have to kind of go out and, and take some pictures and just kind of see when you start to see the grain. You start cranking up your ISO. When you crank up your ISO, you're going to have to turn down the other two things and I'll, and I'll get into that in a minute. But in any event, that's what the ISO is. So ISO is the level of sensitivity of your camera to the available light. It is typically measured in numbers, a lower number representing lower sensitivity, like the 100 or the 50 to available light, while higher numbers mean more sensitivity. So 12,800 will be extremely sensitive. More sensitivity comes at a cost. As the ISO increases, so does the grain and the noise in the images. So again, so those are the examples we just talked about. So if you look at this little film strip, I'm not sure how it's presenting out there on your screen that you're watching on, but I have ISO 100, which is the lowest ISO. It's super, super clean, super, super sharp. You start to push it up, you see just, you know, a little bit of green. This is probably a little bit um, uh, over uh, emphasized, just, you know, just to show the point, I guess, because you can get up pretty high on most cameras today, you know, uh, 800, 1200, even higher, and not notice a whole lot of noise unless you're opening your lens for a long, or uh, shutters for a long period of time, then you'll, then you'll run into the more noise. All right, so that's how you sew. Now we're going to talk about the aperture. Now aperture is basically it's the same as when you buy your telescope. You're buying it based on aperture and for observing aperture rules. Because the more aperture you have, in other words, the larger your lens or mirror, then the more light that it gathers. So how aperture works in a camera is um, is basically how large can we open up those blades to make that hole bigger in the lens. And so if you look um, here in this examples, so this will be stopped down to probably like F22. That's probably about the smallest that that um, uh, hole will get. And the thing with that with uh, um, aperture is the higher the number, the smaller the hole. The lower the number, the larger the hole. So basically, um, if you had your, your lens wide open like this, Depending on the lens that you buy, because some lenses will be like f4, like if you're using like um, you know, like an 18 to 55 kit lens, most of those kit lenses are 3.5 to 4.5, is is the is what they saw. That's what the lowest aperture is. So that means that they can only get um, as low as say four or 5.6 and they, they're not any more sensitive to light. In other words, the hole can't get any larger than maybe say this one, something along those lines. So if I'm at F5.6, I'm the hole size, I'm actually allowing uh, the light to pass through into my sensor might be that big. But if I go to say F2, which is again, a lower number, a bigger hole, then I'm allowing a lot more light to get in. So basically that's what the aperture does. Now I'll just read this little explanation and hopefully this will kind of tie it together. So a hole within a lens through which light travels into the camera body. The larger the hole, the more light passes to the camera sensor. Aperture also controls the depth of field. I'm not gonna get into that too much because for shooting the moon and shooting most uh, Milky Way shots, depth of field is not that important. 
Um, but if you're shooting a Milky Way and you want to get something in the foreground, then depth of field will definitely become something that you have to concern yourself with. And all that simply means is that the, is, is how far from the very closest thing that my camera picks up and to the to infinity, how much of that is in focus. If I have a shallow depth of field, then that means that there's only a very small portion of that in focus. So if chances are going out 10, 15 feet will be out of focus on my camera. And if I'm focused on, say, the rock and not the Milky Way, then everything behind that rock in the Milky Way may be out of focus. So it depends on, you know, again, on, on how you've got your camera set up. But in any event, uh, again, that, that, that relates more specifically to daytime photography than so much, not so much at night, because we're shooting pretty much at infinity anyway. So examples of F numbers are F14, F2, F2.8, and so on. So again, the smaller the number, the larger the hole. The higher the number, the smaller the hole. So that's basically uh, aperture. Now let's move on to shutter speed. Now, shutter speed basically is just how long do I leave my lens open to allow whatever light is out there to sit on my sensor. If I open it up really, really, really fast and close it like really fast, then I'm only allowing a certain amount of light for a certain period of time to get on my sensor. Um, and then if I allow it to be open for a long time, then I'm allowing a lot of light to get on my sensor. So what, how does that relate to what we're trying to do? Well, if you allow your shutter speed to be very, very um, uh, short, then you're not allowing a lot of light to get in there. And if you're trying to shoot something in the sky that's dark, like a Milky Way or a constellation, chances are you're going to have a black image. So you need to open up your shutter speed for a longer period of time so that the sensor can be actually uh, activated by the light from the stars or whatever it is that you're trying to image up there. So, so again, shooting the night sky, you have, to, you have to shoot with longer exposures if you want, say, a Milky Way. Shooting the moon would be the opposite because the moon is very bright depending on the phase. And you would shoot with a shorter shutter speed because the moon is, is giving a lot of light anyway. So as soon as you point your camera at the moon and get it focused on the moon, there's going to be a lot of light coming there. So you don't need to be open as long to collect light because there's a lot coming through from the moon. Sorry, I didn't mean for that to happen. So those are basically the three things. Now, let's go back to the little triangle that we started with, because this is kind of the, uh, the, the this is how we're going to tie it all together for you. So <clears throat> without giving you specific settings and saying, you know, put your uh, uh, shutter speed at, you know, I don't know, uh, 30 seconds and your aperture, I say at F2 and then your ISO at, say, 1600. Instead of doing that, I'm going to explain to you a little bit about how that works in relation to what you're going to be shooting, because that doesn't work for every target. Each thing's different. So when I came up with, um, when I came up, I actually took this exposure triangle off the internet because I wanted one that was quite simple and easy to read. And then um, what I did is I, I related it to when we're shooting the Milky Way or when we're shooting the moon which are the opposite sides of the scale and are the two most common things that people with a DSLR shoot for astrophotography. So let's look at our aperture. So now knowing that the smaller the number, like this F2, the larger the hole. And if I have a large uh, aperture open, what does that mean? That means that allows more light to get into the sensor. So if I'm allowing more light to get into the sensor, then um, if I'm shooting something that's very dark like the Milky Way, well then of course I'll be able to um, ignite that sensor because it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be more efficient and gather light. So it's like trying to look at um, uh, say a, a nebula with a, a little tiny telescope and then having a great big eight inch telescope and the difference will be day and night because you got a lot more light gathering capability. So by opening the hole, it's, it's giving you that same effect. So that's what so that's what the aperture does. Now, staying on aperture, if I want to shoot the Milky Way, it only makes sense that I need to open up more because I need to gather more light quickly. And the reason I need to gather it more quickly is most people have their camera on a tripod, and because your camera's on a tripod, it's static. It's not tracking the sky. So you can only track the sky for so long, depending on the length of the lens that you're using. Uh, before you start to get star trails. So you need light efficiency when you're shooting the Milky Way. So for the Milky Way, rule of thumb, when it comes to aperture, 
Milky Way needs to be larger. Now, when it comes to shooting the moon, for the obvious reasons, it's the opposite side. Moon is much brighter. The moon's uh, aperture setting will need to be smaller. The average setting for a moon shot, say a first quarter moon, is going to be between f8 and f11, uh, and that'll be about your, your starting gate. For shooting the Milky Way, you're going to be between f2 and f4, depending on the kind of lens that you have and, and how much star bloat you want to try to take care of. So this end of the scale, which is considered open, so, so larger Milky Way, smaller, this end of the scale for the moon. Now, slipping over to shutter speed, exactly the same thing. So what happens with shutter speed is if we slow down shutter speed, if we're not tracking, if we're on a static tripod, then we only have a very specific amount of time to be able to shoot something before we start getting star trails. However, if you're tracking um, the sky or you're piggybacking on a telescope that's tracking the sky, then you can leave your shutter open for a longer period of time because you're not going to get star problems because you're actually tracking the sky. So you can get away with longer exposures. But for this um, explanation, if I'm sitting on a tripod and if I'm shooting the Milky Way, chances are if I'm using a, um, say, a 14 millimeter to about a 50 millimeter lens, I'm only going to be able to open that lens without getting star trails uh, for about anywhere from, say, uh, eight seconds to about maybe, maybe 18 or 19 seconds. 18 or 19 for the small, for the wider lens, the lens that like the 14 millimeter, uh, because with a, with a 14 millimeter lens, it's much wider field, which means the stars are smaller. And because those things are smaller, you don't see the movement in the sky as much. Um, so, so basically then you would want, uh, if you could open your lens up for 15 seconds, uh, then, you, you know, again, that would be, that would be say here at 1 15th of a, or actually be 15 seconds, sorry. Um, then um, you're able to gather um, uh, a fair bit of light up to the point where you start to get star trails. So again, uh, for Milky Way, because it's very, very dim, you want to go slower shutter speeds to allow more light onto the center for a longer period of time because the shutter speed is that little curtain that opens and closes. So we need it open longer for the Milky Way. For the moon, again, it's the opposite side of the scale. For the moon, because it's brighter, we don't need to be open longer. We, we can do the moon in a very, very fast sh uh, shutter speed, again, depending on the phase of the moon. So again, so if you're looking at shutter speed and if I'm gonna be shooting the moon, then I wanna consider faster shutter speeds for the moon. And for the Milky Way, I wanna consider lower sh slower shutter speeds. And then finally, for the Milky Way and for the moon, the ISO. Now the ISO is gonna be extremely important, not so much for the moon because with the moon, we're gonna be shooting lower ISOs because the availability of light is already there because the moon is bright. So we're not gonna need to crank up the ISO to take a picture of the moon. In fact, most moon shots are done between 100 and 400 ISO, uh, depending on the phase of the moon. So that's where you're gonna to wanna to hang around there for the moon because you got all kinds of sensitivity. And if your ISO goes down and your shutter speed is, uh, is, is uh, down and your F stops are, are you know, in that low uh, to middle uh, aperture, then you're going to get a very quick picture. Your pictures are going to be very fast. So you're going to have a clean picture. So the moon pictures very rarely turn up grainy unless, you know, you're not setting it up quite right. But now the opposite for the Milky Way is quite different. For the Milky Way, uh, because it's such a dark thing, this is where the combination of these three are going to be extremely important. If you've got a camera lens that will only stop down to 5.6 or f4, then that means you're yeah, going to have to, right. um, but now you know, make up that light because I can only go as, as, as for the Milky Way, four, um, I've got to get more exposure to this thing. So dark. That means I'm going to have to open up my shutter speed more longer to allow more light to make up for the fact that I got a smaller aperture to work with. But if I do that, <clears throat> excuse me, and I'm on a static tripod, I've only got so much time before I get star trails. So I have to compensate for the star trails. So my star trails tell me that I can only be open for 18 seconds maximum on an, uh, on an F2. Well, on an F4, <laughs> I'm not going to get the same picture because it's going to be darker. So, um, so again, your shutter speed, uh, whoops, oh darn, I keep doing that. Your shutter speed will have to be uh, considered 
uh, when you're shooting the Milky Way. So most Milky Way shots, you want to get as much exposure as you can. So that leaves us with ISO. That's the only way we're really going to get any sensitivity to the item that we're trying to shoot, which is the Milky Way, which is primarily a very dark sky. So we're going to have to increase our ISO. So, um, so with the Milky Way, again, when you look at the scale, um, we're going to go on the higher end of the scale. And that's where you're going to sit for most Milky Way shots. So when I'm going out to shoot the Milky Way, I have to consider higher end of the scale. For moon shots, the opposite. It's the lower end of the scale. And because, again, the moon gives off a lot of light, so it's very bright. So you're not going to need a lot of sensitivity because, again, the, the, the moon is bright, and that will create the sensitivity. So that basically is the, the three things I wanted to discuss in relation to the Milky Way and to the moon. Now, for those who are watching this, if you want to take a screenshot of this, please do. You know, Take your camera phone, take a snap of it. Because it's a good thing to actually have with you if you want to go out and try some of these things. Because it'll kind of just give you a little idea of where you should be. And eventually you're going to start to realize, okay, well, it's the moon. It's bright. Things go down. It's the Milky Way. It's dark. Things got to go up. But this will give you some good starting points as to where to put each of those uh, primary settings. If you're going to be, because again, when you're shooting these things, and the one thing I forgot to mention is you're going to be in manual. So you're going to need to adjust each and every one of these things. So that, my friends, are it. That's okay. my... Hold on, Paul. My... <clears throat> We're going to... Oh, I oh, think sorry. I might I might have had enough time for people to grab. So what I did was I, I pinned that uh, picture. Oh, okay. So that people could get a snapshot of it. So. Okay. Um, I'm just going to stop presenting. There we, we go. Should, we should be okay. Okay. So uh, hopefully that wasn't uh, too long and too painful, but that was um, um, basically just something that came up with another course that I was working on. And uh, I think that astrophotography uh, exposure triangle kind of is a good starting gate for a lot of people who want to start using their DSLR or a mirrorless camera. Oh, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, I had a couple of uh, Janice mentioned, uh, can you post this slide on the website? I'm, I don't know if she meant the St. John Astronomy Club website. Maybe we can send it off to, I don't know who does that now. Yeah, just, yeah just let her know uh, uh, where. And um, but you can put it on your site if you want. I'll send you a copy. Yeah, of it. yeah I can send it on my page. Sure. Um, yeah. and, and people can rewind this as well, of course, later and just stop it at that point and snap a picture. Yeah, just watch it on YouTube and just take a snap off your TV. Just take your cell phone out and click and away you go. Or do a print screen, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. Okay. Well, um, all good info because we're coming up to some nice Milky Way. Uh, well, this is the best time for the Milky Way, really. Uh, if you want to. What's that? It's getting there. It's getting there, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Percy meteor shower coming up too as well, so uh, that's nice. Um, okay, now we're gonna, we've got a few things to cover. We've got some photos. Uh, we got a vinyl bud talk. we got a moon contest draw to do. So we can start with uh, maybe some photos. How about that? And then vinyl bud? Sure. Okay. All right. Uh, that's up to me then. That's up to you. That's up to me, I guess. Okay, let's go to share my screen. And we'll do this one. Okay, photos. Got lots of them. Got some really nice ones this week. Um, and some of them were from the moon contest, but because they sent them in to me on my email, uh, I kind of included them on our on our photo uh, delivery tonight. So just give me a sec. I'll come up with the first one. With... I don't open up the wrong screen. That's good. Let's try it over here. Here, that should do there it. There we go. Okay. So this one comes from Kathy Adams. Kathy said, I shot this uh, back on June 20th at 4.30 p.m. with my Celestron 6SE and my new Celestron solar filter. My first solar image. Not bad. Nice sunspot. There. That Don't have to. Don't try to scratch that one off your lens. That is a sunspot. Yeah. <laughs> nice, nice, Kathy. Uh, this one, she said, I watched the clouds and heard the thunder all afternoon on Wednesday, June 30th, and then saw this cloud formation developing at about 7 p.m. Wow. Grab my camera. I love cool. that. <laughs> not sun, not the night sky, but still pretty awesome. Uh, Cumulonimbus clouds developing. That is beautiful. Gorgeous. And then she says, uh, finally, a clear night here. I, I just took this. Uh, I took this just as the blue sky was darkening. It was also the first night Doug was able to use his binoculars, and he had a fabulous view uh, with those. More clear skies would be nice. Oh, that's not... That's Tim Libby. Why is that in there? Oh, where's your third picture? It's in there. 
Well, isn't that something to skip right by it? And we'll, try, we'll try to get back to that. She did have a picture of uh, Milky Way. Let me see if I can get that. Hang on. Why skip right by one photo? Uh, open with... Uh, this is what happens when you're live. Oh, okay. No, oh, okay. Missed that one. Anyway, sorry, Kathy, but we'll get that one on next week. Uh, Tim Libby brought this one in uh, for Saturn. And uh, his capture of the moon. Nice. Nice, huh? Is that a lunar V? There's the snowman. I think he's got the snowman. Yeah, yeah there's the, the right there. Yeah, right there. And there's, the X yeah. there's the X up there. Yeah. yeah. Nice shot. Nice one. And a snowman. And a snowman, and a yeah. Snowman. yeah. The, the drunk snowman. <laughs> drunk snowman. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and there's a nice... Uh, so he's using the reflector. Nice well, detail. But... He was in there twice, oh. that's why. There. Oh, uh, this one, Alan Burgess. Alan Burgess sent this one. Another attempt at imaging a Messier object, M101. Nice um, shot. The more I practice, hopefully uh, it'll get better. He said it was imaged back in June. Nice one. That's awesome. You're doing great, Adam. Adam, keep it up. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. This one came from Mary Craig. Milky Way shot from July 31st. Very nice. Wow, yeah. Did she say what she used? Uh, she doesn't, no. Okay. I, no, I'm she might, you know. no, she might be on here tonight. So, uh, I was going to say a camera, but hey. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Mary, for that beautiful shot. Beautiful shot. It is nice, Prance and Pony and all. And here's her second one. So, yeah, Prance and Pony right up here. So yeah. that's what Where's that's it? what the Prance and Pony is, right? That's his head here, and there's his leg, front legs, and back legs. Yeah, and he's, and he's prancing. So you, um, where's the clouds, Chris? The Sagittarius clouds? Right in here. I was gonna say the clouds are down below it, but. <laughs> I think they're right in here, aren't they? That's that's He's one of the that's one of the clouds right there. Huh? He's talking about the clouds here on Earth. All clouds, yeah. Yeah, they're down <laughs> here. Yeah. The clouds are yeah, cool. Right there. Yeah. I love that's a nice clouds. photo. That's Very that's nice. that's just as nice as Cygnus right in there, you know. It's beautiful. Just as yeah. nice, if not nicer. <laughs> <That's a> <laughs> so this, kind of, this kind of image it is, yes. I'll I never agree. win that argument. I'll never win. <laughs> uh, this one came from a gentleman named Zer, Second Seas, um, Saturn, Jupiter, and the Moon uh, picks with the Moon Towers. Yeah. Wow. Look at the shadows. Yeah, the yeah. shadows on them. Fantastic. And and the Terminator line. Awesome shot. Awesome oh, shots. Awesome. Yeah, all of them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is what we get in our summer sky right now. Saturn or Jupiter We're sitting up there, very pretty, really nice and high last night. Uh, Stefan Picard sent this one. Hi, Chris. Uh, Saturn from Wednesday evening. Kind of okay with the final result uh, as it was low in the sky, and I used a number 27 Celestron orange filter, which explains the color, but it helped bring out some detail. It does. Uh, it sure does. Yeah. Uh, stabilized, sure does. stabilized in PIP, uh, stacked in auto stacker, uh, wavelets adjustments in Registax, and image color and sharpness in Adobe Lightroom. Yes, awesome sir. shot. Very well done. Yeah, you can see the Cassini, and you yeah. can see a lot of the bands on the, yeah. on the planet. Yeah, it does make a difference. Yeah. The contrast is unbelievable when you use filters, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> from there, we have Ooh. David Samard. David Samard sent these ones in of Jupiter nice. and Saturn. Jupiter. Jupiter. That's Jupiter, yeah. Yeah. Look at the bands. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. And wow. There we go. moons. There we go. There's the fourth moon way off the way end. Here. Yeah. The Galilean moons. And you have to overexpose Jupiter to get that shot because you'll you yeah. won't get to see the moons otherwise. So you heard the new latest that Ganymede's got some water? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the uh, sensed water vapor, I guess, right? Yeah. So, uh, but it's yeah. 160 kilometers below the surface. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. I thought they sensed the organic compounds, too. I, I'm not sure. I, that's That was sort of the condensed version of what okay. I got. Condenser. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Uh, mm. This one came in from uh, Stephen Watson. There it is. So Steve says, uh, bu uh, full buck moon at 98% uh, full over high Station in New Brunswick. Yes, sir. Well done. 
Wow. Never gets tiring looking at that, eh? Hey? No, no. no. There's a full moon there. An almost, yeah. Is that, I don't know. Is that almost? I was going to say that's about like 98 percent or 99. Very, very close. Yeah. Very, very close. Yeah. That's from Steve as well. Nice. Robert Cadet got these ones. Robert, I uh, went to his page and grabbed these ones because yeah. I saw him snapping this uh, from last night. He says, "Wow, well, Cygnus area Cygnus. showing the North America Nebula and the Butterfly Nebula." And the next picture shows Bernard's. Bernard's yes, ear. sir. Last picture shows a Sagittarius star cloud. Wow. Well done, Robert. Very well done. Yeah. Yeah. No, very nice. So Gotta love Cygnus. Cygnus. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last cloud, Sagittarius star cloud showing the Eagle Nebula and the Omega Nebula. Uh, still yeah. a bit of trailing, uh, very rough polar alignment. Guide scope. Oh, guide scope is next, he says. <laughs> there you go. Yep. Yeah. Here's yeah. a picture no, of Cygnus, but if you really want a picture of Cygnus, yeah. <laughs> and I think he said he was using a 50 millimeter lens. A 50, yeah. Oh, yeah, portrait lens. Yeah, so you take your, you know, everybody's got a camera. If it's even a kit lens, it's 18 to 55. Yeah. So the perspectives that he just shot with his camera, you, you can get that too. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, a little bit of, you know, figuring out how long you got to keep it there and stuff, but still. Nice. Yeah. Very nice. Well done. Yeah, North, North American Nebula. Can you see it, Chris? Can you point to it? Uh, no, I don't really pay attention to this part of the sky. <laughs> <laughs> and, and well, here, you tell me where. Okay. <laughs> okay. The North American Nebula. Mm -hmm. Just the one little elephant trunk on the bottom there. Yeah, your mouse is on it. Right there, just yeah. Up there. there it is. There's the North Florida. American yeah. And then right beside it, it looks like two two big bright stars right, right beside it. Oh, this side. This side, the other side. Oh, this side. Up. No, down. Okay. Yeah, a little bit. Down. Oh, right there. These two. And the other side. He said to be right beside it. These two? No, move, <laughs> move to your right. Okay. Move and to your right. Go up just move. a little bit. Okay. So you're going too far. You go up and All then right. go to your. Anyway, right there. Stop. Stop. Okay. Right about where Maine is. Right about that block. That is, is the Pelican Nebula. Pelican Nebula. Okay. And if you've never seen it, like I can see it now, it's as plain as day. And then that bright star right above all that is Denim. It is, yeah. Right there. Yeah. And if you go back to your uh, about 1 o'clock position, you're going to run right into Sadar, which is the next brightest star. And right below that is the is the Butterfly Nebula. That's what yeah. you're looking at right there. Okay. And if you went a little further up Sadar, say about, uh, and then go to your right now, and then drop down a little bit, that's uh, the Crescent Nebula is right in there. So just for those things that could, you know, if, you know, with processing the images just a little differently, all of those things will pop right out. And uh, yeah. you could probably yeah. almost see the veil. The important part is if you come back to Sonar and down a little bit, you'll also find M29, the cooling tower, which right. nobody ever takes a picture of. Right. Because <laughs> it's not pretty. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah, that, that is just so rich in, uh, in uh, stars and uh, hydrogen alpha. And it's crazy. Amazing. And he wasn't using a filter on this. This was right out yeah. of his camera. Right of the camera, yeah. 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 Absolutely. So go to show you. You know, you don't have to spend a lot of money and a lot of stuff to get a great image. So. That's it. Yeah. Good job, Robert. Keep it up. Yep. Uh, now, this guy. Uh, yes, sir. Watch this. Matt, Matthew, you pray. Yeah, yes, that's very yeah. nice. Oh. There it is. Yeah. That's fantastic. Now, is that tumbling because of the Russian. Uh, <laughs> that's the iss passing over folks um so that was captured he says a uh, few videos i took i was using a canon t7i tracked it manually by just loosening the clutches on my eq mount he has a second one here too i think well done yeah right, uh, here uh and uh, sure. he used an set and also had to make sure the collimation was spot on uh, just before the pass started i had stabilized the video on pip i'm amazed that the detail could, can be seen yeah, it's incredible, isn't it? It's fantastic. Little solar panels. Especially that's hand tracking. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. That's a that's a hard target to get. That is hard. Oh, very well done. Moves very quickly. Well done, yeah. All right. And that's it for photos. Wow. And I'll stop presenting. So thanks, everybody, for those. And if yeah. you want to send in uh, more photos, we're happy to get them. Send them into Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com. Uh, there was a couple that were just added to my page, I think, just before we went live. So... I wasn't able to get those uh, on there, but um, 
Well, you did say too, the night uh, I took this video about a minute after the ISS pass ended, I seen another satellite in the same path as the ISS, and I was wondering that might have been uh, NACA, uh, whatever, the NACA module from um, Russia, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it could have been, yeah. Could I have very well been, <clears throat> yeah. There, there was one time when I saw this, the, the actual, I mean, I, nobody, sure. I wouldn't, I wouldn't believe it myself if I had heard it, but I did see, I had my telescope set up looking at the edge of the beach. And I knew the ISS was coming over the top and I set my telescope. So I had it right through my crosshairs and sure enough, the ISS came through the shot or I'm sorry, I looked and I, and I, and it wasn't the ISS and it was something kind of glowing. And then when I looked at my eyepiece, it was a shuttle and it was coming back and the, and the space station had come in through the eyepiece just behind it. And I was using my 11 inch and there's like, I had to actually yeah. turn my eyeball away because it was so bright when the, yeah. when the space, but I couldn't believe that I had, I didn't know that the shuttle was ahead of it at that time. So it was just kind of nice. I saw it glowing underneath and it was wow. pretty neat. Yeah. <clears throat> it was cool. Like, wow. Yeah. Right up. Anyway, that was, uh, and then I woke up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay, so from there we've got uh, a vinyl, let's do a vinyl bud talk, and then All we're right. going to have a moon contest draw, and then we've got uh, a Rosanna talk. We can yep. squeeze all that all in, I think, tonight, so. Off to you, Mike. I'm going to push this back to full screen here. He's going to be coming up here. There he is. Yep. There he is. Hey, bud. Hey, bud. Oh, Ian Howard's now... Summertime, believe it or not, with all, even with the clouds and stuff we've been having, it is summertime. Bino Buds target of the week is, if you're into baseball, the home plate. Oh, yes, sir. This is new to me. It was new to me, too. Oh. It's a nice asterism. This asterism field is located just west of M31, the Andromeda Galaxy, which is very conspicuous in binoculars. And with a binocular field of view of seven and a half degrees, you can just barely put the home plate at M31 in the same field of view, believe it or not. Wow. So if you were to look and say, where do I find it? Well, most of us are pretty good at finding Andromeda, but you go outside at midnight, and I'm choosing midnight because that's when it's actually still dark. Turn your body 70 degrees east, northeast, and you find the great square of Pegasus. You come down, most people find Andromeda by coming down one, two stars, and then going up two stars. And if you find Andromeda, it's just to the west of Andromeda. Like I said, you can catch it in the same field of view. If you put Andromeda at the edge of your field of view, you'll catch the, the home plate just to the left of it, or right of it, sorry. What does it look like? Well, one, two, three, four, five. Guess what? It looks like a home plate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's how it got its name. There's a double, or double here and a double here, but you can definitely make out the shape of a plate. And it's a pretty good size. In 10 by 50 binoculars, it's exactly what you're going to see, the stars that make up the perfect home plate. And if you look at the full moon, it's actually larger than the full moon. So it's an easy target, simple to find in the sky. And it's kind of neat. When you do look up and see it, sure enough, it looks like home plate in a baseball field. So that was Bino Bud's uh, summer shot. And now the truth comes out. A key moment in astronomical history. The cat's tail hits the telescope. Oh, by accident. <laughs> <laughs> so it should all go to the cat for finding the Galilean. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. Love it. And that's Spino Bud's target of the week. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Mike. Another great target. Lots of targets, lots of summer sky targets, and lots of excuses to get outside and get uh, and get some learning done. Um, okay, so we got two things left. We got the uh, moon contest, and we've got uh, Rosanna. Do you want to try Rosanna first? Because we missed that last week, didn't we, Paul? Yeah, we did. Yeah, so um, let's do that first. We'll hang on to the moon contest. I know folks wonder, are waiting to see, but okay, it'll be on let here. Let me try and get myself red. Red. Okay. okay, there. And then I'm going to share my screen, and we'll see if we can make that make that so number one. And now. Or hardly hearing it. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Hey, did you hear it? Nope. No. <laughs> you know, I can't hear it. Boy, I have to hear. There must be something, some new algorithm in the um, in the software. 
because I like I said it's it's it just goes through my microphone. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Let's talk about Rosanna, never mind that. So um yeah, so this week Rosanna has sent, I think, a very, very cool uh Rosanna fun fact. So it starts off, but she says, Hi Paul, I tried to add a Beatles tune. Um, but for some reason it failed, but I'm, I'm going to try to add one to the end of this. So here's the fun fact. What Beatles song has both the numbers 31 and 50 in it? Anybody know? Mm, no, no, nope. no. Some people out in, in, in uh, space land may know, but in any event, it's Maxwell silver hammer. So what does that have to do with anything? Well, 31 and 50 make 81. And the draft copy of this fun fact was started on Tuesday, July 27th, when we had 81 days until the launch of Lucy. Now, yes, Lucy will soon be in the sky with diamonds. If you consider all the twinkling little pinpoints of light that sparkle like diamonds, Lucy takes its name from the fossilized human ancestor whose skeleton provided unique insight into humanity's evolution. Donald Johansson, a paleon, uh, a paleoian, paleo anthropologist. Oh my God! He's for you to say. Yeah, <laughs> he was playing, uh, he was playing a, a Beatles cassette at camp the night after the fossilized remains were found. The song playing was "Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds," and thus Lucy was named. Similarly, similarly, the NASA Lucy mission will be uh, will revolutionize our knowledge of planetary origins and the formation of the solar system. How so? Well, Lucy is scheduled to fly by seven of Jupiter's Trojan asteroids. Jupiter is thought to have more than one million Trojans, larger than one kilometer, 7,000 of them have been cataloged. These asteroids are thought to be um, the primordial um, material that formed our outer planets, basically a time capsule from four billion years ago and i'm going to see if i can make that happen if that gif will work if i blow it up there you go there yep so uh so during the course on this mission lucy will fly by seven jupiter trojans the time lapse animation shows the movements of the inner planets mercury which is brown venus white earth blue mars red jupiter orange and the two large trojan swarms which are in green during the course of the lucy mission now, the song Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds is not a tribute to LSD, as John Lennon had earnestly stated in many interviews, especially with Rolling Stone magazine. His son Julian drew a picture of a classmate at preschool. When John asked him to explain the drawing, Julian stated that that's Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Now, just a second, when I shrink this back down, I'm going to go to the next picture. Oh, one more. There we go. Yeah, I'm gonna blow that up. So that's Lucy. So it's uh, so that's Lucy in the sky with diamonds. The classmate was Lucy Vaden. However, the urban belief persists, as this psychedelic poster of Lucy might indicate. So the first of the Trojan asteroids up there. So you can actually print this poster on one of many uh, other choices from the. There's a website uh, which I can post if somebody's interested in having that. So, let me shrink that back down, and we'll move on to our next picture. So, according uh, to the Forbes magazine, installed earlier this month on the Lucy spacecraft, a Lockheed Martin space um, at Lockheed Martin Space in Littleton, Colorado, the time capsule contains messages from the likes of Albert Einstein, Carl Sagan, Martin Luther King Jr., and all four members of the Beatles. Now, George Harrison. This is what his quote was. When you seem beyond yourself, then you may find a peace of mind is waiting there. John Lennon, and in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. Sir Paul McCartney, we all shine on like the moon and stars and the sun. And Sir Ringo Starr, being the, uh, the wordy guy he is, peace and love. Peace and love. <laughs> peace and love. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, um, let me just blow that up again. There's the Beatles. So if I had to pick a song to accompany Lucy on her journey, it would be The Long and Winding Road. 
as her mission will last nearly 12 years from the start to finish. In another unique twist, Lucy's first flyby will be of uh, 52 246 Donald Johansson asteroid, named for the discoverer of the original Lucy. So October the 16th will truly be the beginning of the magical mystery tour. <laughs> well, uh, isn't that fantastic? Awesome. awesome. Yeah, and that is this week's and da, 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 da. Well, there it is. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was going to say. Thank you so much, Rosanna. Sorry for my interpretation. <laughs> Apparently, my sound's not working. But this was a fantastic fun fact. Thank you so it much. It was. <laughs> Thank you, Rosanna. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're going to have to sing the ending too, Paul. Sorry. <laughs> I will. I will. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to share my screen then for now. Thank you very much for that, Rosanna. And uh, let's go. Awesome. To, I loved it. Let's go to this part. Okay. So I've got some uh, photos to share, of course, with the mm -hmm. contest. We had a moon contest. Uh, shoot the moon. And why is that? Okay. And uh, actually, a good little video here that I'm going to show. And see if that pops up in the right spot. No, it yeah, I can't hear it. No, really. What? <laughs> I can do this, so I think. Hang on. Oh, funny. Uh, maybe it goes this way. Now, you guys might have to turn your volume up, what you're watching on Facebook or YouTube. I think I think the uh, audience out there will be able to hear it, though. Okay. Okay. You should be able to see it, but you might not hear it. But there is sound. Okay, so let's... Uh, these are the photos that were submitted uh, and that are in the contest. So I put them together in a little uh, clip. Here we go. Hey, we're back. Yeah. Awesome. Shots. Yeah, awesome, eh? It was really nice. So, 
Um, there was uh, some clips in there, of course, of planets as well, because the contest meant uh, that if you took a picture of uh, the night sky with the moon in it, then that was one uh, entry. And if you took a picture with uh, planets in it, that was another entry. And there were some shots there with the moon and planets together, so I just counted them as an extra entry. Um, and if you shared the contest, you had another entry, so you had an opportunity to get three entries in the contest anyway. And so what we have now is some prizes to give away. So uh, I have two uh, one-year subscriptions to Sky News Magazine, which is the Canadian Astronomy Magazine, to give away. Uh, what I'll do is I'll make arrangements with you after the show uh, when you win, and um, we will uh, have that delivered to your door. Or to anybody that you'd like. So that's the other thing. Uh, those two prizes can be given to someone uh, that you, uh, if you already get the magazine, give it to a family member or a friend or whatever. Um, great magazine, uh, six issues a year. I look forward to it because it's not a bill, bill in the mail. So great. <laughs> you look at open the mailbox. Oh, wow, look at this. <laughs> Something for me. Uh, and the third thing is, of course, is our basket, our astronomy goodies basket. I want to say thanks to Mike Powell for a donation of most of this stuff anyway. I uh, can't really see it without, with my background put, on, so right, I'm going to take my yeah. background off. Hang on. Put it right in front of you. Put it right in front of me. Yeah, right in front of you. They knew you can see it. There. Can you see okay. it now? No. Right in front of the background. <laughs> uh, uh, All right. It's Hang a on. foreground picture. I'll, I'll get rid of my background shot. Hang on. Uh, change the background. Uh, okay, funny. let's go. Like this, this. There we go. There's just my background. There we go. Okay. There it is. So lots that's the... that's the, that, Yeah, lots of goodies in that one. So we've got... Uh, I the night sky book, uh, astronomy books, uh, there's maps in there, there's cards, there's a special hat that has uh, LEDs in the front of it, so you can wear that hat at night, like Mike has there. Yeah, just like that yeah. one. Show us, Mike. Uh, there we go. Hey, so it's perfect for reading, uh, reading maps and things at night uh, when you don't want your eyes to be blinded by the light. And uh, this is the Sky News Magazine. It's, uh, that's what they look like, so that's what you get in the mail. And six times a year, and they've got a really nice uh, uh, star map here in the center, which is the current month, so it tells you what's going to be up in the night sky this month, and lots of other things in there, articles about uh, about the RASC, and uh, anyway, things like that. Good astronomy magazine. That's a good good magazine. Okay, so let's do some draws, and we got uh, two draws for the for the one and uh, for the one year subscriptions, and then one draw for the uh, the main prize. Who's going to do this one? Mike or Paul? Oh, yeah. This is that salad bowl again, so uh, don't tell my wife. <laughs> don't tell my wife I uh, got this one. Hang on, dude. Okay, one of you. Set. Oh, wait. Okay. All right, you ready? One, one, one. Here we go. Okay, set. Go ahead. Grab one. Okay. okay. All right, let's see what number one is. So the, for the one-year subscription to Sky News, first winner is... Charlotte Dupuis. Yay! Hey. 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 Here you go, Charlotte. That's for Charlotte. Awesome. Hey, okay, one more. Who did who did that one? Both of you? Mike. Mike, Mike. Mike oh, can do Mike. this one. Oh, okay, Mike can do this one. All right, Mike. <laughs> uh, that one. All okay. right. <laughs> And the second uh, prize of the other one-year subscription goes to David Samard. Yay! Hey, David. David's a regular contributor to photos to our page. Thanks, David. Yeah. Okay, and the grand prize of the Astronomy Goodies Basket. Now, th this prize has to be picked up in St. John. Um, I'll make arrangements with you to pick it up uh, in the next day or so. You know, if we can have someone else uh, make arrangements to pick it up, you that's fine, too. Cat. Your cat can do that one. <laughs> well, she's outside right now. First time the cat's not there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. First time she's not at my feet. Yeah. We don't want to see a cat master face, though. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody, good luck. Last, last, uh, well, put the way up here. Let's mix them up really well. That's From it, folks. Please. That's it. Good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, here we go. Last name. Got it. Okay. And the winner of the Astronomy <laughs> Goodies basket is Danielle Zemerda. Danielle. Oh, awesome. Hey. Right on. Hey. Okay. Congratulations. 
Congratulations, everybody, and thank Daniel. you so much. For, yeah, Daniel, thank you right very on. much for uh, for entering uh, the contest. I think um, I used to work with them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, Good for you. Hope you enjoyed the contest. Uh, it was nice to just get out and take a look at the moon and the planets, and uh, we'll probably have another one sometime down the road. I'm sure we will. Yeah. They're usually pretty popular. We had over 80 photos for this one, so it was awesome. So, okay. Uh, let's go from there to uh, what do we got from now? We're done. Hmm? Oh, we're That's done. It, folks. That's it. That's it. Oh, 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 but before we finish, um, I just want to make an announcement. For those who would be interested in this or who, uh, 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 what was going to be happening, what was planned to happen, but it's not going to happen, are the star parties at Fundy National Park and at Mount Carleton, both uh, due to um, two factors, the main one being the uncertainty of uh, COVID. Um, so they're not going to be holding either of those star parties this year. And I am waiting to see what's going to be happening with uh, Kusha Bequack which is later in the fall. So by then we'll have an idea as to what's going to happen or how things are trending. And uh, so that one is a possibility, but the other two, uh, Mount Carlton and Funday are a no-go for this year. And next year we'll wrap up for a great uh, star party in both regions. Yeah, Wouldn't be much time to plan it either way. So. No, this year, yeah, it, now it's just too, um, yeah, we couldn't have done it. Yeah. 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 Well, we'll be back, and the stars aren't going anywhere, so uh, the plants That's will right. come around again next year the same time as they did this year. Uh, hopefully, right. so we'll have better weather next year. We'll have better weather <laughs> next year. <laughs> wow, what a month this has been. Yeah, so even August, I mean, August is usually a really good month, but it uh, doesn't look too promising at the moment. But anyway, I think it's clear night tomorrow night, so tomorrow night, uh, Saturn's at opposition tomorrow night, so this is the best chance to take a look at Saturn. Uh, if you've got yeah. a small scope or larger, uh, you'll get this even in the four-inch scope, you should be able to see Saturn and its ring system. It'll start to separate then between the ball and the ring at about four inches and up. Um, and uh, Jupiter is also at uh, opposition on the on 19th of August. We'll talk more about that later, but tomorrow the big show is uh, Saturn's at opposition. We also have a Perseid meter shower coming up uh, this month, and it's going to be great this year because we're not going to have any moon in the sky to worry about. So it'll be an awesome time to be out underneath that sky for that. No astronomy equipment necessary for that one. Okay, so that's it for tonight then. So uh, in closing then tonight, again, uh, our special thanks once again for your continued support out there. And our special thanks again, of course, to Rosanna for her continued contributions to our show. Really do appreciate all your efforts out there. And we Absolutely. also like to thank uh, all of you who share the program with others as well, including our most faithful sharer, Trudy Allman there. Uh, Trudy, thank you very much. And remember, uh, we do love getting your photos, so send them into Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com or send them into my Facebook page, either one, and uh, we'd love to get them on the show for you. Uh, we're also looking for suggestions for topics for future shows. I have a couple of topics now uh, built up that we're going to talk about. So if you have anything that you would like us to discuss on a future episode, please send your uh, request to the same address, Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com, and we'll make it happen for you. Also ask that if you enjoyed the content here tonight and you joined us from YouTube, please consider subscribing to our channel. And please let your family and friends know that uh, uh, we're here every week at the same time to help uh, educate, mostly entertain, but educate too, uh, <laughs> on, the night, on the night sky. <laughs> so for now then, from Mike and Paul and I, uh, stay safe everybody out there. Wish you all clear skies. And remember, as we like to say, guys, keep your scopes. Point it up. Point it up. Good luck, Mr. John Reed, on your venture. Yes, good luck, Mr. John Reed. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone. Hey, there it is. Hey. Bobble hits.